Hello, everybody, and anybody who might be watching this. This is the uh, first uh, edition of the Boneyard, which is the old uh, title used for a blog carnival. Uh, but I decided to do something new with it, uh, try something live. Uh, you know, I had looked at Periscope and all this other live sort of stuff, and that I wasn't really sure about it. But I figured it'd be cool to do uh, a little show about you know, what's new with, with fossils. There are more stories than I can possibly cover during any given week. So this would be a chance to just chat about what's new and interesting that I might not have time to sit down and actually write about in absolute detail. Um, and I'll try and take this week by week. We'll, we'll see what happens. But for now, uh, we might as well start with uh, Brontosaurus. I mean, that's what people were asking me about all uh, last week and in the week before. You know, the Brontosaurus is back. You know, what's what's new? Why do we get this dinosaur back all of a sudden? I mean, there's much rejoicing all over the internet. But um, you know, it's also a, a really this complicated backstory. You know, why is Brontosaurus back after so many years being gone? Um, so the new, th there wasn't a new uh, skeleton. There wasn't a new uh, fossil discovery per se. It was a, a new paper written by Emmanuel Schopp and his colleagues. It was published in Pure J, I think about two weeks ago now. And what they did was they made this really big family tree of what are called diplodocid dinosaurs. So those are the dinosaurs with the you know small heads and long necks, relatively gracile dinosaurs. Many of them are in uh, Jurassic sediments in the American West and also in, in Europe and a couple other spots around the world. So animals like Apatosaurus and Diplodocus and Supersaurus and a couple of other ones. Um, and what they wanted to do was figure out how are all these dinosaurs related to each other uh, on a specimen by specimen system. Uh, you know, you can pick one dinosaur and you figure out, okay, well, this is the representative for all the dinosaurs of this particular genus or species, but they decided to go specimen by specimen and see, like, basically whether these species hold up, whether these names that were established are relatively consistent. So amongst the dinosaurs that they looked at were uh, Apatosaurus and the specimens that used to be called Brontosaurus. Now, years and years and years and years ago, I think it was 1877, um, when Othniel Charles Marsh, who was working at Yale, got a bunch of bones from a uh, of Arthur Lakes. And when Marsh described these, he decided to call it a new dinosaur. He decided to call it uh, Apatosaurus ajax. Now, two years later, you know, Lakes goes out to Como Bluff um, at Marsh's request, and he digs up more dinosaur bones with the rest of the crew out there, and they send them to Marsh at Yale, and Marsh says that um, these bones are from a different dinosaur, that the, these bones should be called Brontosaurus excelsus. And because of that, I know we have these two long-necked, small-headed sauropod dinosaurs that seem to exist in more or less the same place and more or less at the same time, but they seem to be distinct enough to warrant these different names. For Marsh, it was all about the anatomy of the hips. It was a different number of fused vertebrae in the hips. There's a couple of other characteristics. Really, he jotted down these descriptions uh, as paragraphs very, very, very quickly. Um, now, in 1903, along comes Elmer Riggs, another paleontologist, and he goes back to Apatosaurus, and he goes back to Brontosaurus, and he says, well, you know, actually, these two aren't all that different. They're not as different as Marsh initially thought. Uh, they're different species, but they sh should be the same genus. They should have the same name, and since Apatosaurus was named first, then that had priority over Brontosaurus. So Brontosaurus, you know, at least technically, should have been scuttled. Um, the problem was that as museums collected their own dinosaur specimens and started putting them up, up in halls, uh, they went with the old name. And Brontosaurus just kind of sounds cooler, doesn't it? So uh, for whatever reason, you know, this is sort of lost to history, uh, paleontologists started calling these dinosaurs Brontosaurus in public, even though uh, in the technical journals they should be Apatosaurus. And it wasn't until the 1970s that uh, paleontologists started to sort through, um, you know, that this, this mishmash of what, why are we using these two different names? It's basically the discovery of the skull. The skull of Apatosaurus that was found in Dinosaur National Monument is mislabeled for a long time. They're basically putting the right skull on this dinosaur, end up in this big uh, dinosaur renaissance name change and body change. You know, the, the Brontosaurus of the mid 20th century with that blunt uh, skull with the spoon-shaped teeth and its dragon its tail and its elephant skin and all that stuff. Um, that was totally replaced by this much more active looking animal holding its neck and tail high and kind of wandering over these floodplains rather than living in the swamp itself. Um, so that's another part of misunderstanding. I feel like I'm going on this long historical tangent, but this part of the story has nothing really to do. Like, like Brontosaurus was not a chimera. It wasn't a fake dinosaur. It just was another name that 
and to be a synonym for a bit of stress. But along comes this new paper just two weeks ago by Shop and colleagues saying that there are enough specific differences between Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus to justify making Brontosaurus its own name again, to make it what we call a valid taxon. Um, so this is relatively controversial. Basically, the, the way that the scientists did this, they used something called cladistics. You, you look at a dinosaur skeleton and you mark down all the little traits and then you dump all that data into a computer program and it comes up with the most likely family tree for those dinosaurs. Now, based upon uh, which researchers are doing it and what traits they pick, you might end up with different family trees. Um, so the same researchers can look at the same set of data, they can look at the same skeleton and still come up with sli something slightly different. But at least in this new paper, uh, this new hypothesis, it's that there are enough differences between the other Apatosaurus species, or at least two of them, and what used to be called Brontosaurus excelsus to justify Brontosaurus coming back to us. And, and that's kind of cool. It's nice to have that old name back once again. Um, but, you know, when, when everybody was asking me, how, you know, how do you feel about Brontosaurus coming back? I mean, I wrote a book called My Beloved Brontosaurus for Crying Out Loud. And, uh, you know, I, I made this big deal about, you know, this, this dinosaur that I knew in my childhood that was lost forever. And, and now it's back. And, you know, people thought that I'd be you know, elated about this, that, you know, I'd basically be holding a big party and inviting everybody over to celebrate the return to Brontosaurus. And I have to admit that possibly having the name back does sound kind of cool, but it's not the Brontosaurus I knew when I was a kid. I mean, the, the one that I knew from the land before time, the one that I saw uh, in so many picture books and other books about dinosaurs, um, you know, that one is, is gone forever. We're never going to get that Brontosaurus back. So for me, at least, you know, as interesting as, as it is that, you know, Brontosaurus might be this distinct genus of dinosaur that might be part of this great flowering of sauropod diversity that we have uh, during the late Jurassic in North America. Um, the Brontosaurus that I grew up with, it, it's never coming back. And that's a good thing. I, I appreciate that, in fact, because that acts as the baseline for us to figure out how much dinosaurs have changed since then, uh, you know, it gives us the old image versus the new image, so we can start to really see, you know, how the science has, has developed. So, you know, Brontosaurus now, you know, it's not going to be that blunt skulled, like sort of Camarasaur y kind of thing lumbering through the swamps. It's more or less going to look like an Apatosaurus, a slightly thinner neck, you know, some very slight differences in uh, the rest of the skeleton but it's not all that different. Basically, unless you're a paleontologist and you know someone showed an image of an apatosaurus here and a brontosaurus here, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. And that's okay. I mean, that's, that's kind of cool. It's cool to have different species and there are a lot of questions that come out of this uh, in terms of just what's the environment like? You know, how, how can these sort of very seasonal floodplain-like environments just covered with ferns and cycads, you have stands of conifers um, throughout where the skull of Apatosaurus was found. You have Apatosaurus, Diplodocus, Barosaurus, Camarasaurus, these, you know, at least four large sauropod dinosaurs living in the same environment, along with some of the smaller ones like Stegosaurus and Camptosaurus. And if you look at the Morrison formation as a whole, this formation that, you know, these great sauropods come out of, um, you have ones like, you know, Supersaurus and very large Diplodocus species uh, down from New Mexico, and you've got Brachiosaurus, and you may have some other genera and species. So are all these dinosaurs living at the same place at the same time? And we, you know, they're really competing with each other or some, you know, are more abundant because they're living in the habitat in which they're buried and the others are sort of transients moving through. There's a lot of resolution that we don't quite have yet, but by sorting out, you know, which species is, is which, and, you know, maybe there's much more diversity than we expected, we start to get these ecological questions. And this is something that I don't think has gone up yet, but I wrote a, a short post about um, in response to an article that I saw by an Australian uh, presenter and uh, paleontologist named Paul Willis, where he's saying, well, it's really kind of frustrating to see, you know, all this stuff about brontosaurus. It makes dinosaurs, uh, makes dinosaurs. It makes paleontologists sound like stamp collectors that, you know, we're just concerned about the nitty gritty stuff that we don't really care about the big picture things. And that's what paleontology is all about is figuring out, you know, the course of um, the history of life on earth, these big patterns, and maybe what it can tell us about the future. Um, 
So he really took umbrage at the fact that Brontosaurus was getting so much media attention. Uh, you know, I can't necessarily agree with that part. I mean, you know, anybody says Brontosaurus is coming back, that's going to be a big news story. How could it not be? But names are are important. You know, if you have a collection of, of 10 dinosaurs that you find in the same place at the same time, more or less, or at least buried in the same deposit, it looks like they're all killed and buried together. Uh, it's important to figure out, do I have 10 species of dinosaurs? Do I have one species of dinosaur? Are they all the same thing? Is it all Triceratops? Is it Triceratops? Ceratops all the way down, uh, that will change your estimate for what you think of how these animals are living together in terms of extinction events, in terms of evolution, and who's immigrating from where. All these big questions that I think Willis was really trying to get people to pay attention to. It all starts with taxonomy. It all starts with figuring out you know, what dinosaurs we, we have. Um, so yeah, I mean, to get that big picture stuff is very, very basic. It reminds me of... Um, so this review that was written in the late 1800s. So there is a paleontologist in Philadelphia named Joseph Lydy, brilliant guy. There's a book about him, a biography of the last man who knew everything. And uh, I think in Lydy's case, it was really um, quite accurate. He's one of the last true naturalists who knew something about everything, you know, rather than specializing in a particular field. And um, Lydy wrote this book that was a ca basically a catalog of all the um, Mesozoic reptiles that were known from North America during his time. You know, beautifully illustrated but it was more or less, you know, this is the species and this is where it was found. And when this got published, uh, a reviewer that only went by the name of H, so they're kind of being a coward, not actually saying who they were, but all the same, in this prestigious British journal, the H said that, you know, this, this book by Lighty contained no real science whatsoever. That's just basically, uh, you know, that, that North American paleontology was the implication that hadn't evolved to the point to get to theory. So, you know, it was fine and that didn't contain any errors, but it wasn't really doing science. And, you know, that was really well, kind of a dick move on this guy's part, but it was really quite depressing to 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 see this um, you know other expert putting down the work of his fellow scientists because the context of this was in in Britain by the, the uh, late 1800s they had already mapped a lot of geology they thought they knew uh, just about everything they knew the progression of life through time and uh, everything had already been studied so they could move on to theory they could move on to you know were things evolving in in what way and how fast and all that sort of stuff whereas in North America at the same time paleontology got a relatively late start. Uh, you know, by the time that Lighty was working and, you know, Cope and, and Marsh, who basically pushed Lighty out, out of science, it was still new stuff. Basically, we didn't know what was in North America. We had no, almost no idea what was in the American West, these great fossil boneyards that gave us dinosaurs like Brontosaurus. And the first step to figuring this out was actually looking at their bones and figuring out what animals do we have and how many are there and, and you know, these basic sorts of relationships before you can get to theory and building all that other stuff. Uh, so I think th that, if for no other reason, is why uh, all this Brontosaurus stuff is important. It's not just a name. It's part of this larger story that we're just starting to get to. So that takes care of the sauropod in, in the room. Uh, the other big news today was the release of the new Jurassic World trailer, and I can only really touch on that briefly. Oh, someone's opening the door. It's the cat. Hi, Margarita. Uh, I have many small mammals that may or may not make an appearance during this live stream. Um, but yes, Jurassic World. So I'm an advisor uh, on the Jurassic World website. I think the last two dinosaurs um, that need to go up, or at least last three, I think is Pachycephalosaurus, Parasaurolophus, and Velociraptor all went live on the site today during this big, big push. And, you know, the international trailer came out um, featuring lots of dinosaurs roaring and running after people and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I'll just say it looks like a very, very fun but going back to some of the other dinosaur news from last week, or at least the same week as, as Brontosaurus, these things came out pretty much in, in quick succession, just one right after right after the other. Um, we had uh, Despletosaurus cannibalism. So if you don't know the name Despletosaurus, it was a Tyrannosaur, you know, just a bit before Tyrannosaurus. Some people have pinned it as possibly the ancestor of Tyrannosaurus Rex, whether that's true or not, you know, sort of remains to be seen. But all the same, this, you know, large, impressive Tyrannosaur dinosaur that lived in, uh, you know, the area that's now Montana and parts of uh, Southern Alberta. And um, this was the, the study was done by Dave Hone and Darren Tonkey, and uh, it was about cannibalism in Despletosaurus. So the specimen had been known for, for a little while. I think it was collected in the 1990s, 
Life Curry in Alberta, um, but nothing has been done with it yet. So Dave Hone uh, raised uh, the funding to go to Alberta and study this thing firsthand. So this open access paper, also in PeerJ, uh, is the result of, of their labors. And it's pretty cool because this sub-adult Despletosaurus, this young Tyrannosaur, uh, he had a really tough life. Well, I shouldn't say he because we don't know the sex of the dinosaur, but this dinosaur had a very, very difficult life. It had bites all over its skull, you know, whether or other that was studied or if that's entirely clear, but basically from the front of the snout to the back of the skull, this this animal was just pockmarked by healed wounds. And and when paleontologists look at these sorts of injuries, the sorts of damage in the fossil record, uh, they're really looking for two things. If, if the bite marks or the injuries seem fresh, then it's hard to tell whether that was from you know a fight that killed the animal or that was from scavenging, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but if they're healed, that's a sign that this animal survived that attack at least long enough for these signs of uh, injury and healing to show up in the bone. So in this case, all over the skull, there are you know, many signs of healed wounds. So this showed that this Tyrannosaur got in lots of fights, uh, got bit in the face quite a bit, uh, and it survived most of them. So it would have a really like kind of gnarly, scarred face. Um, so, you know, if you remember the reboot of, uh, well, I guess it's not even the reboot, it was in the original, uh, The Land of the Lost, you know, scar face or scar, I guess, not scar face, it's not Tony Montana, the, the, the dinosaur, scar the Tyrannosaur. Um, you know, that's a relatively decent depiction of these large dinosaurs. And we know from other specimens that they fought by biting each other on the face. So a couple of years ago, there's a study about Jane, the juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. She also has bite marks right on the front of her snout. Um, earlier than that, Darren Tanke wrote another paper with Curry uh, all about bite marks on other theropod dinosaurs, mostly Tyrannosaurs like Gorgosaurus and Albertosaurus from Alberta, but also Sinraptor, this allosaur from uh, Asia. So it seems that you know you have these dinosaurs, even ones that had relatively large hand claws, uh, they're still fighting by biting each other on the face. That's their primary weapon. So I guess to tie this back to the Jurassic World trailer uh, for a second, it'd be a little unusual actually to have a large theropod dinosaur, even one with thumbs, picking up its prey and tossing it around. It'd be more likely to do what a spot hy spotted hyena does and just go straight uh, for the bite. So we have this really injured Despletosaurus, gotten lots of scraps, lots of different injuries. Um, but there are also relatively fresh wounds on that same skull. And what this suggests is that uh, this dinosaur was cannibalized. The only other dinosaurs that lived in the same environment that were large enough to do this kind of damage and were also predatory dinosaurs were other Despletosaurus and possibly uh, Gorgosaurus as well. So this seems to be a case of, you know, Tyrannosaur on Tyrannosaur violence. You know, we, we don't often get these sort of pictures in the fossil record, but um, they're these stories in stone, they're, they're life events in the, the particular, uh, well, yeah, they're life events that happen to these animals. They, they tell something specific about what they went through. And, um, joined with other evidence. So we, there's a paper that came out a couple of years ago, I think in PLOS One, um, showing, bite marks on Tyrannosaurus rex bones that could have only been caused by other Tyrannosaurus rex. So it seems that for Tyrannosaurs, you know, biting each other on the face, but also cannibalizing each other was uh, quite a common mode of life. And can't, you can't really blame them, you know, in addition to, to fighting and chasing after prey, if you see, you know, a dead dinosaur on the ground, you're a carnivore and it's fresh meat, you know, why not go after that? You know, they're not making, they didn't have the taboos that we might have about cannibalism. Uh, I mean, I'm glad that we do have those taboos in our society, but for Tyrannosaurs, no such thing existed. So, you know, meat is meat at the end of the day. Uh, one of the other recent stories that caught my attention this past week was um, just came out today, actually. It's a, a new paper um, about concavenator. So it's this um, allosauroid dinosaur described a couple of years ago and initially made a big splash because it was supposed to have quill knobs on its arms. So these have been described from Velociraptor before, and this particular dinosaur, concavenator, seemed to also have these bumps on its arms that were suggestive of basically the, the central vein of complex feathers sort of locking on to each of those. So this might have been another indirect example of feathers in a non-avian dinosaur. Well, since then, you know, that evidence in concavenator at least has, uh, you know, 
come under a lot of scrutiny and it seems that these might be uh, from muscle attachments rather than feathers. They're not evenly spaced. They don't ex exactly look like the quill knobs that we find in a velociraptor or a modern day bird. But um, all the same, your research on this dinosaur is continuing. It's good because this is a you know near complete uh, specimen, excellent preservation. And even though there weren't um, you know feathers coming off its arms, or there may not have been anyway, it had another very bird-like trait. So this new paper, which I think is in P3, I'll try and put a link in when all this goes uh, live later or gets uploaded to YouTube, um, is about a structure called podotheca. So you see these on bird feet. So when I was a kid and I was in elementary school, I remember the science cart came to our classroom one morning and the uh, teacher brought out these little chickadee and I pull these tendons to get the chicken feet to flex. It was really this kind of macabre thing, but I thought it was really, really cool. It reminded me Birds, you know, a birds have both. Look at the feet of any bird, a pigeon, a chicken, an emu, a penguin, anything you like. They have scales as well as feathers. Uh, but when did that sort of like those shield type scales on the feet, you know, evolve? When did they show up? They're often reconstructed on uh, the feet of predatory dinosaurs. But how do we really know that they're there? Um, well, thankfully, Concavenator shows us that these dinosaurs, at least allosauroids, had them. And since allosauroids are not a primitive group of theropod dinosaurs, but you know, lower down on, on uh, some of the branches in the tree, they, they suggest that you know, non-avian theropod dinosaurs had this sort of shield-like leg covering, these podotheca um, sort of arrangements of scales, you know, long, long ago. Um, so, you know, minor thing, something that we didn't necessarily, you know, know from, from the modern animals, um, but it, it's still cool to get a little bit more resolution with the fossil record. Um, and, you know, this is going to be a relatively theropod heavy <laughs> uh, live update, I guess. Uh, well, the other paper is also in open access this week uh, was about Deinonychus. So I feel like this is all tying back to Jurassic World somehow. And that, you know, Deinonychus is obviously um, related to the, the image of a velociraptor that we see rat running around with and is his raptor pack. And this new paper was actually on the flight ability of juvenile Deinonychus. Now, when John Ostrom described Deinonychus in 1969, it was a major change in, in paleontology. No one had really seen a dinosaur quite like this before, with the sort of very stiff balancing tail, the sickle claw being uh, held off the ground on the second toe. It just looked active. Um, and it also helped solidify the connection between birds and dinosaurs, at least in Ostrom's mind. And, you know, Bob Bacher was a gra his graduate student. Bacher obviously took this and ran with it. Uh, so the, the skeletal anatomy between Deinonychus and Archaeopteryx helped pin down this connection between the non-avian and the avian dinosaurs. But for the most part, you know, since then, Deinonychus has basically been seen as a terrestrial animal. I mean, it's a big dinosaur. It can more or less look you in the eye if you're standing in front of it. At least a big in individual might have been able to. Um, so this is not something that you'll be uh, airborne for the most part. It's just too big. Uh, well, in this new paper uh, written by William and Kristen Parsons, they identified some juvenile material of Deinonychus you know, in pre-existing collections. And what they suggest is that the shoulder girdle wasn't arranged in such a way that the young Deinonychus could have basically flapped into the air that they might have been able to fly. Um, now, this is going to be up to biomechanical studies. You know, we're not
sorry about that. Uh, my I don't know why Comcast is terrible. The internet just goes in and out at this time of evening. But thank you for sticking with me, all, all three of you that I see on the counter down there. So in any case, we're back to Deinonychus and the idea of Fowler and Scanella at all, um, that these dinosaurs are actually going after small prey, that they're acting like modern day raptors, and that they were you know, pouncing on the small prey, pinning it down with those large second toe claws and flapping their arms uh, in order to keep it down. You know, you can see this behavior yourself if you ever see a hawk or an eagle uh, taking down something like a mouse or a shrew or, or other small prey. So rather than piling on to Tenontosaurus like we saw in so many different, uh, you know, pieces of paleo art and museum displays, that they're actually small prey specialists. So there might be some kind of flapping ability. I mean, there's enough articulation that they didn't have the flexibility of wrists that we do. So, if, you know, when you do an impression of a lost raptor, you know, they couldn't do this. They didn't have the bunny hands thing. They had to hold their hands facing each other, you know, all in that they had some ability to do this. So maybe this idea that juvenile Deinonychus were able to flap a little bit, maybe you know, they could glide a, a little. It's an interesting idea. We'll, we'll see if it, it comes to fruition. Um, you know, Mike Habib, who is a um, paleontologist who specializes on the evolution of flight, has pointed out that basically if you take a small Deinonychus or something like, you know, Anchiornis or Microraptor or something like that, and you put feathers all over it, which we know from great fossils that you know, was absolutely the case, uh, they basically become aerodynamic by default, that they're capable of some kind of aerial locomotion. The question is just what kind? Were they actually flying? Were they flapping through the air? Were they gliding? Was this something different? Uh, was it some kind of bizarre way of moving that we've never seen before? Um, they're still so trying to sort that out, and that's the problem in paleontology between you know what an organism actually did and what it was capable of doing. But uh, you know, hopefully, you know, with all these interesting and sometimes controversial hypotheses about you know flying Deinonychus and other things showing up, we'll we'll get a better picture of how many dinosaurs flew. My own personal feeling is that you know flight is not something that just showed up in the line leading to birds, that this was an experiment that was tried by many m members of this, you know, Deinonychosaur sort of group that, you know, you have multiple evolutions to this and some of them took off, pardon the pun, and other ones did not. So I guess we'll, we'll find out. Uh, and one of the last things that I wanted to talk about this evening, I feel like this is going far faster than I meant it to, I'll try and take a question something uh, next time to, to make sure I've got a little bit more going here. But uh, I wanted to put in a word for a post I recently wrote about uh, a fossil mammal, of all things. You know, many people think of me as the dinosaur guy, but uh, fossil mammals are just as cool, if not cooler. And it's one of my favorites called Uintotherium. So it's basically from my current stomping grounds. Uh, the first specimens were found out uh, near Fort Bridger in Wyoming, which is about two hours to the east of me. And um, just fantastic false mammals. They're about rhino size. They lived about 55 million years ago or so. They were some of the first mammals to get really big after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. And they have these paired sort of, they weren't horns, they're ossicone type structures on top of their head. You know, so sometimes two pairs, sometimes three. Um, but you know, this very knobbly headed looking thing and they had saber fangs and that's really cool so you know even though i call them saber fangs they weren't used for predation these were herbivorous mammals of all things and, and those fangs seemed to be sexually dimorphic which means that they were uh larger in one sex and smaller in the other and it seems in this case that the males might have had the larger canines and this is something similar to what we see in baboons today if you ever see a baboon yawn especially that threat yawn that some of them do if you get too close um you know, the canines are much, much longer in the males than the females. So this also seemed to be the case in you into Ethereum you know, so, so long ago. And aside from just looking weird and from being out in the West, it's also one of my favorites because it was one of the first animals uh, to be the focus of the bone wars between Cope and Marsh. So, you know, many people, when they think about the start of the bone wars, they think of, um, you know, the time that uh, Othniel Charles Marsh, you know, from Yale, went down to the New Jersey mines where uh, Edward Drinker Cope was getting a lot of his fossils, and uh, the two were friends at the time. And, you know, unbeknownst to Cope, Marsh bribes one of the foremen basically and says, send all those fossils or send a good number of those fossils back up to me. I want to study them. You know, Cope finds out about this and is absolutely livid. Uh, shortly thereafter, Cope finds the skeleton of Elasmosaurus, so, you know, long necked marine reptile, sort of, you know, they used to describe it as a snake threaded through the body of a turtle because of its, because of its shape. Um, but Cope put the head on the wrong end and he and Marsh disagreed about this. So they got Lighty to come in and settle this dispute and, 
uh, Lighty sided with Marsh rather than Cope, and that really like killed whatever friendship these two young paleontologists had with each other. And so the Bone Wars first group that they kind of descended upon uh, was what we call the Dinocerata. Marsh coined that name, uh, first represented by Uintotherium, which Lighty named. Lots of names of researchers and other animals, uh, and it only got worse as, as these people tried to describe them, because um, you know, pr prior to this point, you, know, you had Cope, who was working on a lot of fish and reptiles, uh, you know, both modern and some fossils, and Marsh had his fossil birds, and they kind of had their own stomping grounds, and they kind of avoided each other, and researchers would funnel you know, specimens of one type to Cope and the other type to Marsh, and it was sort of working itself out. But then all of a sudden you get these huge and strange fossil mammals coming out of the American West. You know, Lighty was amongst the first to name them, but uh, Cope and Marsh started to get them as well. And, you know, of course, you know, when they find them, they're getting them from fragments and they're naming them entirely different things, you know, and, and they're so worried about each other. They're so worried about their competition that, you know, at least on Cope's part, he starts to telegraph his results in. He starts to telegraph in species descriptions to the Philosophical Society, um, in Philadelphia, and uh, you know, some and they came in so fast, and scientific names don't really translate that well to telegraph messages. So you get these garbled sorts of message messages. So the secretary of the society would have to apologize to the group and say, like, okay, Cope's naming some new stuff. I don't know what it is. When he gets back, he can do it formally. And at the same time, you have Marsh, who, you know, he also has his own sort of journal to, to publish things in as quickly as he can. And um, everything that he's listing in his own bibliography, he's mentioning like, you know, the date that it came out, the date that was basically a pamphlet, which was like a short form thing, the date that like the initial talk was given. So being really meticulous about all these dates so we could establish priority. So very quickly, you know, you go from just two animals, Light Lighty had accidentally named the same animal twice as both you went to Ethereum. So we'll just stick with that for now. So we have you into Ethereum, Cope and Marsh name at least two different genera a piece, um, and it all starts to look like it's the same animal. It starts to get really, really complicated very, very quickly. So you have these guys in journals and in meetings standing up saying that other guy's work is total trash, like don't believe that mine is more accurate. Uh, and it basically comes down to, you know, Marsh and this, you know, it was really a jerky move, but a masterstroke strategically saying, well, listen, Cope is telegraphing in uh, all his names and his descriptions and stuff. So what, you know, when does it count in terms of when he actually named the stuff? Does it count when the initial telegraph was sent, the one that was all garbled? Does the correction count? Does you know the, the sort of writing of the paper count? Does it count when that pamphlet was distributed to other interested parties for comment? Does the final publication count? Uh, basically what Marsh was guy like it's it's not his work wasn't ready until it was finally published so all this telegraph stuff just ignore that i got to the same fossils first and therefore my names are accurate so i should have priority for all this and of course you know neither of them would agree with each other and both of them would say you know my names are right and his names are wrong and ultimately all turned out to be you went to theorem so lighty beat out them both but uh, it was still just this I think just fascinating episode uh, where you had these two paleontologists like you know at each other's throats, and their peers were both intrigued but embarrassed by this entire thing. But out of it, we got a really fantastic fossil mammal, and I wish more people would actually study it. Um, so you went to Ethereum, it's this classic animal at the heart of the Bone Wars. Lots and lots of skulls and other specimens are known, but it's more or less been forgotten about. The last major review of the group that it belonged to uh, was last reviewed in 1998, I think, in a technical volume called uh, Evolution of the Tertiary Mammals in North America. And since then, there's almost been nothing. And there's, you know, some confusion about this animal and where it fits into the big mammal family tree. I mean, some people play it um, next to hoofed mammals. Other people place it r near these rabbit-like things. So there's this kind of running joke that these were like saber-toothed bunnies that got to giant size. Um, how that's resolved, you know, no one's really done the legwork for that yet. And just even their paleobiology, are they living in these swampy kind of habitats? Are there more terrestrial creatures? Uh, were they covered in, you know, short fur like a taper? Were they entirely rhino skinned and naked like we often see? There's a lot of really basic stuff about their paleobiology that we don't know, which I think is kind of a shame. Hi, Margarita. <laughs> Given that, you know, they're this classic, classic group. So I'm, ho oh, not Margarita, it's Teddy. Sorry, Teddy. So hopefully somebody will be inspired 
to you know go and have another look at you into Ethereum. And that's pretty much everything that I wanted to discuss, but I want to put in one more plug for something else. The project is nearing completion. I think they only have about a week or so left, but uh, my friend David Orr and his wife Jenny uh, are running a project called Mammoth is Mopey. Uh, it's a children's book. It's an alphabet book with you know wonderful illustrations done by David and Jenny. Um, and, you know, very creative. I mean, there's so many kids books right now with, you know, prehistoric life in it. And a lot of it's kind of rehashing the same sort of stuff or it's just, you know, like A is for Albertosaurus and that's it. Well, in their book, they have like Ankylosaurus is artistic and has this great, really funny drawing of an Ankylosaur in front of an easel and you know, on and on, on through the book. So if you want to support something original, if you want to support something really cool, uh, Google Mammoth is Mopey. I think they have uh, their Indiegogo campaign at uh, mammothismopey.com. Um, you know, it's like 20 bucks or so to get, you know, a copy of this book when it's done. You also get to support something new and original. So I certainly encourage you to do that. And, uh, you know, I haven't been able to look at Twitter or any, see if there's any comments. If anyone's curious about what the beer is, it's Evolution Amber Ale by Wasatch. Uh, it's a great session beer that we have out here in Utah. And I mean, how could I resist something like that? So, you know, thank you, uh, those of you who tuned in and, and stuck around. And uh, hopefully I'll give this another try in the not too distant future. Until then.